Thank you, Alex, and uh, it's a pleasure to talk to so many people here about uh, the CRC program. So my plan was to uh, analyze, to review the Sheep Genex program, mostly like has it been successful, what were the main components of that success, and what have you learned, and how should we go forward? Now, Michael Thompson has kind of already summarized our program, so I, I can use some time to use some of Michael's ideas. Um, so first of all, he said it was a success, but also he tells us always, if, if you analyze things, don't use essays and large words, just use Twitter and simple things. That's what the president of the US does as well. So <laughs> what I did is uh, I, I, I took, a, I have a computer program now that can turn text into pictures and keywords. And so what you see here is actually a, a, the result of the, the chapter about the CRC genetics program that's in the book. But if you don't want to read more than 100 words, like. Uh, the president of the US, you can just use this program to uh, get the main things. So anyway, um, Michael told us that it was a success, so let's see uh, why it was a success. I think there's three key points uh, that underbuilt that program that, that made it really uh, relative to the world in sheep, certainly the most successful, but also relatively to beef in Australia, probably very successful. Uh, and, and I think the top one has been the key of that is uh, that we had a very large data set to predict from, and that's really been the information nucleus. I'll talk a bit more about that in, in a minute and, and what followed from that. Uh, genomics has been, of course, an important radar, but genomics is something that happens anyway. It's a bit like the internet. There's lots of people in California developing lots of good technologies, and we've, we've not developed it, but we've just used it in a, in a clever way so that um, that people, the end users, actually got something they could work with. So how do you turn a DNA test into something that a farmer can use? That has been the, 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 the purpose of our program. Uh, but very importantly, at the end, we, we already had a system in Australia to deliver things. We had land plant first, and we had uh, seed genetics and, and Merino Select. And that was already a platform to deliver things to the, to the industry, mostly to breeders and breeders understood a certain language that we could build on. So if we didn't have that, we wouldn't have been so successful. So a lot of that actually was already in place, and I think the CRC was just lucky that a lot of those things fell together and that we could work with. So um, another thing, and that's of course a typical CRC activity, but again, we worked with seed genetics a lot here, is that, that um, we worked a lot with industry to make it happen. And, and I think an important aspect of the CRC, we've heard that yesterday, was that they have actually tangible tools that came out of it that people can use. Like unlike some previous CRCs that, that was more papers and science, the, there's here a lot of outputs that, that people can use. Um, so let's go to a few of those key points again. The, the large data set, I think the information nucleus flock that started in 2007 was really very key to a lot of the success. Because if you don't have data to predict anything from, you can't give an output of a DNA test to a breeder to predict the merit of an animal. So that, that's been the basis, and so we, we used a bit of data from the sheep genomics flock. It was a large project, AWI MLA, um, about 15 years ago, and I have a, a, a successful follow-up from that. Much larger, much many, many more years. Uh, but MLA had the wisdom to keep going with that program, so we had now have the resource flock, and every year we still collect lots of data that otherwise would not exist, and otherwise we would not have to predict genomic breeding values from. And but also increasingly we use industry data. So breeders, they collect lots of data. And, and if it's data that's interesting because others do not collect it, like reproductive data, we can help them and genotype those animals. And again, that creates a whole large database that we use for, um, for joint prediction. So at the moment in Australia, we have 65,000 genotyped animals. And we've used that not only to make breeding values, but also we have used that for research. So in, in our last few years, of those 65,000 animals, we have predicted the full genome. Uh, and so for every animal, we have a prediction of 30, 30 million genetic markers, and we can compare it with the data we have on those animals. So of course, not all of those 65,000 are measured for everything, but we have more than 20,000 animals measured for IMF, for example. So it's a really rich data source, which is the basis of what we've achieved. Um, just to, what we really want in the future is the genomic test that is 80 or 90 percent accurate. In, in the dairy industry that already exists, because they have been collecting data for 50 years, uh, we've only started recently, and, and our predictions are a lot less accurate. But you see here already, the, this is what we would have from the INF, that's the light blue, but three years of resource flock data, that if, if you added that to it, then you already increase the accuracies. And we have now six, seven years of resource flock data, so 
we, we're nicely creeping to an accuracy here, but we really want to be at, at 80%, and, and we need a few hundred thousand records for that. But this time, that will grow, and, and that's going to be uh, the future development. The, keeping having good data to predict from is, is key to the success here. Um, the other key point is, of course, the genomics. So we haven't developed the SNP chip ourselves. It was a good international consortium that did it. Cyro had a large input in that. But we were one of the first big users of it. So the first SNP chip, uh, we call it 50K because there's 50,000 markers on it, was launched in 2009, and we immediately could genotype thousands of animals with it and, and see if genomic predictions actually work. So we worked with NeoGen then to make a cheaper one because that first chip actually we paid $250 for each sample. And as you know now, it's, at the moment it's only 27. So the prices have almost gone down by tenfold. But that 12K that we developed for the industry was only $50. So that was already a big step forward for people to use that without subsidy. Also, the other DNA tests for parentids and polled have really helped the industry to think about, oh, if I do DNA tests, I actually can get some interesting information and base decisions on. And, and that has been a real success. Uh, we're really proud to, uh, that, that at the end of the CRC, and this will be launched probably in a few months, um, the, the, what's maybe called the GGP Sheep CRC 50K. And what that is is really, in the last few years of research, we have selected 10,000 most predictive markers so from the sequence data that we had, we picked 10,000 markers out of 30 million. Uh, and so we do that based, what this picture shows is there's, those are chromosomes that every animal has. And on which regions of the chromosome do we have a marker that predicts a lot of variation for traits? So based on that principle, we, could, we picked 10,000. 10, and with NewGen, we worked to, to put them on a new chip. And that will be launched in a few weeks. So in a few months, maybe. Jason can tell us when. But overall, that gives more accuracy, and so we keep working on new tools that, that are going to be cheaper and better, which is very important. Um, the, the other, the final key point, evaluate and implement, so, and, and sheep genetics is really at the basis of this, of course. So we started with introducing blended breeding values, so we weren't sure about this DNA test prediction, so we, we said, oh, we have ASBVs, we trust them. Let's see how that works with the others, and let's put them together. And we started very slowly to make sure that we didn't make too many big mistakes. But uh, two years ago, we introduced single-step genetic evaluation, which means that all the information you have about animals, their pedigree, their DNA testing, and all the phenotype, all the performances they have, you put it all together in one big evaluation, which is the best way to get unbiased predictions. And so EGBU achieved that two years ago, and it was one of the first in the world at a national level to have an evaluation on that scale. And uh, I think we, we were quite proud of that. Um, also, an, an important implementation is the eating quality index. So for the first time, we had now information about carcass traits and eating quality, like intramuscular fat, tenderness. And so we needed an index for people to see how the animals would rank according to those traits. Um, so that was introduced a few years ago, and the important thing of that is that we have now a changing genetic trend. Just to give you an, an idea of the importance, so genetic trends uh, have a large impact. If you look at the last few decades, we have six-folded the value of sheep production by changing our lambs a lot, so that's a lot due to genetic improvement, and uh, so that, that's a big impact on the industry. But what we're doing now is we're changing the eating quality. So IMF we noticed is going down if you keep selecting for more growth and more muscle, and that trend has changed, so now we, we have changed the direction and selecting for better quality. So the industry engagement, uh, besides helping people with the breeding program design and what are good strategies, there's a few concrete outputs of the CSC that I think they are very important. And I just want to look at the flock profiling. So this is an example of a New England breeder that, that is fine wool. And so he did a flock profile on his animals in 2015 born. Um, and so the numbers mean that 100 is actually not good. It's very bad. You're at the bottom of the 100%. 10 is very good. You're in the top 10%. So he was very good for fiber diameter, but as many New England breeders, terrible for fleece weight. And in the profit index, he was in the, in the bottom, this 80 out of 100. So um, he can choose ram sources. And uh, James told me not to mention who it was, but. Uh, let's call this the man behind the mirror. Um, so that was his typical <laughs> ram source. Um, and if, if you use that, you get, uh, he wouldn't change his flock. But an alternative ram source is somebody 
who measures a lot, and let's call this guy Baldy. And so he, he bought some of those rams, and he really changed what he could achieve, a lot more fleece weight, and mostly on the profit index, he did a lot better than before. So they have now a tool to see what rams are good for them, and, and ram select can help them do that. So in summary, uh, I think we've achieved a lot. We have a new tool, we have an uptake, we have changing trends, and we have changes in behavior of RAM buyers, and that's the key for genetic improvement in the whole industry, of course, that people actually look at those numbers and, and use them. So I think in the future we can do still better, and, and uh, I'll very briefly point this out. We're going to match genetics a lot more to the environment, to the production system, and to what the client wants. And we have now tools to help us do that with genomic testing also in, in, this, in commercial industry. Um, so what has been very important in our program is the collaborative approach. Uh, DPI VIT has been very good on the genomic side. EGBU very good on the evaluation side, and UNE a bit across all of those. And also with the meat science, we've, we've worked very well together, and hopefully we can keep doing that. So just finally, the very large team and lots of names of very good people that uh, have contributed to this uh, program. Thank you. Mr. Chairman.